Yay. Okay, I think I've got your attention. That's good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So, Tense, hello, bonjour, bonsoir, maintenant. Okay, um, we are ready to get started. So, I would, we'd like to start first. I'm going to invite my, Mitch to come forward and do the land recognition. My name is Mitch. Um, I am of settler heritage. My ancestors pus pushed indigenous people off uh, land in the Maritimes and in Manitoba. While it's important to acknowledge the history of the land we are on, I really dislike laundry list style land acknowledgements. I've been told I should speak from my heart. If I truly, if I truly spoke from my heart, I would probably just scream in rage and sadness for a couple of minutes. I'm not quite sure how helpful that would be. Um, instead, let me speak of the history of um, the Papas Chase Band, who for a short time held reserve lands close by and who we have some membership uh, here with us this evening. Um, that land basically is bordered on the east by 17th Street, if you're aware, um, the south by 30th Avenue, west by 119th Street, so that's kind of Southgate Mall, and then north uh, on 51st Avenue, so that whole area. Um, yeah is where, where they had land. Um, so in 1877, Chief Papas Chase uh, signed an adherence to Treaty 6, which should have entitled the band to about 50 square miles of land. Maliciousness on, the, on behalf of the inspector at the time led to less than 40 square miles being set aside in 1880. Pressure from settlers in the area, lack of promised provisions by the federal government, and subsequent starvation of band members, lies told about... <sighs> Lies told about the half-breed script program and other defeats, deceitful and illegal activities led to the surrender of those reserved lands by three male members of the band at a meeting called with four days notice in 1888. Monies from the sale of these lands have been mishandled by the federal government and band descendants have received none of the compensation they should have. This is common story all across Canada. Their efforts toward restitution and reconciliation continue to today. We live, work, play, and earn on stolen land. And understanding this is reconciliation work. Thank you, Mitch. And at this time, I would like to offer this gift of thanks to Lewis Cardinal, our guest speaker this evening, with great appreciation for him taking the time to come here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lewis. Now, next up, I'm going to invite the president of Westwood Congregation, Lorraine Kennedy, to come up, and she has uh, a few special words to share with you. It's, it's really my deep honor today to be able to welcome everyone here, and in particular, introduce members of the Pappas Chase First Nation number 136. If you'd give a wave when I say your name, Chief Darlene Missick, Councillor Holly Teed, Councillor Len Steinauer, oh, I'm sorry, he didn't make it, um, Councillor Victor Coutre. Okay. And as Mitch just explained, Westwood is sitting right on, right here, right now, on land that was set aside for Pappas Chase people in Treaty 6, and that agreement was not properly fulfilled. As part of Westwood moving beyond land acknowledgement, the name of our series, we've been educating ourselves and the community and collaborating with this band. So I'm delighted that Pappas Chase First Nation will soon have a part-time office downstairs, and they plan to hold programs and events here. I look forward to a long and cooperative relationship, and I am really excited. So Chief Missick has a few words for us before we start the program. Would you like to come? My name is Chief Darlene Missick of the Papas Chase First Nation Number 136 Association. I am a direct descendant of Bato, headman of the Papas Chase Indian Band, and uh, also from Isaac Degno. 
and our council here and our some of our members are present today. Uh, they are verified descendants of the Papas Chase Indian Band and a group that was known as the Edmonton Stragglers. These people were on our treaty pay list of the Papas Chase Indian Band as well, uh, but they were designated this haphazard uh, description of being stragglers uh, by uh, the uh, Indian Act Administrator when they were surveying the uh, reserve and the, the reserve entitlement, so the treaty land entitlement. This place here was known as the Two Hills. So this area here wasn't on our reserve that was allotted to us. It's a little bit more that way, but um, this had been our traditional territory, the Two Hills. And the reason being is because there was two hills here and a lake. And we had our teepees and our community set up here before we enter treaty. Uh, we also, um, but when we enter treaty and it came time to surveying the reserve, the and, and, and these are, are, are things that had happened, but uh, they, the surveyor intentionally cut this place in half, the two hills are, are in half, went straight through it. So uh, land that we had were used to living in, our ancestors were used to living in, was taken from them in, in an indirect way, legal way, but in a way that was supposed to make us feel good about ourselves, which obviously it didn't. Um, and that was these little little things along the way, but uh, I, I don't want to take up uh, any more time that uh, that should belong to Louis Cardinal. I'd like to say thank you very much for your kindness and uh, for your understanding of our of our arduous journey. We are going through uh, a, a few uh, uh, situations that are causing us to become stronger, though. So it's helping us. Uh, truly become who we are are supposed to become once again. So thank you for this place. And uh, Tawa means there is room. So thank you. Okay. Um, we have our genealogies uh, on this little table as a um, an example of the uh, strict verification process that we do engage in with a forensic genealogist. And, uh, and and given the milieu of what we're involved with, with people identifying to be from things, uh, it's important that we do our own due diligence and make sure that everything is accurate, not only to serve ourselves properly and to do what's best for ourselves, but also for the benefit of the public. Uh, the public needs to know who they're dealing with. And uh, under the provisions of the UNDRIP, uh, that is, uh, that's something that's going to be required. Uh, if you're going to operate in the name of a community and, and allege that you come from that community, under Article 13, you have to actually come from that community. So this is the right we're asserting, and Canada has a positive obligation to ensure that the financial resources and the support is there for that community to operate in that name. Uh, but, as long, but the verification process is essential to that. So. That's what's on the table there. You could see the, the extent of uh, forensic genealogy we have to go through. And it's been a labor of love. And uh, we're grateful that we have the right people showing up at the right time to help us out, such as yourselves. And we thank you. All right. So my job here is mostly to welcome you, direct traffic, answer any questions that you might have. and. My job is not to keep speaking. So I am going to turn things over to Lewis and let him share anything he wants to share about himself and his stories. Can you, can you hear me back? Oh, there we are. Okay, great. That was something wrong with my ear there for a second. <laughs> well, first I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the wonderful company and the generosity and the hospitality and the kindness and the caring that you've demonstrated to, to our people by engaging in these wonderful opportunities to share. Uh, I was just uh, sharing the story that my very dear friend and mentor, um, Elijah Harper, uh, before he had passed away, he was, uh, he was close friends with my father. <clears throat> and during the TRC, when it was announced in 2008, and I asked him, I said, well, him and I were at some conference somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, how come you're not on the TRC? And he said, well, he says, it's, he said, I thought about it. He goes, I was asked. And I thought about it for a while. And I thought, well, I think, he said, that real reconciliation is going to come when the people sit and talk. And he said, that's what I prefer to do. And, um, and I took that, those words from him 
and applied that into my own life. Because I think it's important that we as Canadians, we as treaty people, we as relatives, we need to take that time to sit and talk. Oftentimes in this busy world, as you know, we get distracted and we forget to do what really helps us to be connected as human beings. And that is this simple act of what we're doing here today. We're sitting together as brothers and sisters, as extended family. We're sharing in food and we're sharing in story. The basics that have kept human beings together since we can remember. Because we do need each other. And it's through these processes, this type of ceremony here, is where we connect each other into, in a very different way, in a very deep way. That's why it's always important to take the time to sit and talk story and learn from each other and take the best of what we have from each other and move forward together. That's, that's largely why I do the work that I do. My Cree name is Sipigo Gisik, which means blue sky. When I was given that name in ceremony, the elders told me that your life is going to be about building bridges between the world, the worlds that don't understand each other. Not so that we can meet each other in the middle of the bridge and shake hands and then go home. They said, no, it's for us to go all the way to the other side and to learn what is there and then to bring that home, but also to welcome others to come to our side and share with them what we have so they can take our gifts home with them as well. And so that's the basis of my resume um, and the work that I do uh, in this community and, and in other places uh, around the world. But I think it's always important for us to connect and to remember uh, each other through, through stories and to remember ourselves through our own stories and our own histories. So when I was offered this tobacco and this wonderful gift, I'll be bringing this to a Kichikawaski and offering it on behalf of the congregation here and to give thanks and ask for the Creator and Mother Earth and her ancestors to bless you all for the work that you've been doing with great appreciation. So thank you so much. Uh, I just need to find out about the, uh, the PowerPoint and do I just say next slide? Is that how it's going to work? Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, I also want to recognize my relatives who are here, the Papa's Chase uh, family and community. Um, I've been told uh, that uh, Papa's Chase is my uh, fourth great uncle through, uh, th through Lizette. We were just talking about this as we were running around, kept looking <laughs> at the, <laughs> the genealogy, because I'm a genealogy nerd too. And it's so important for us to remember who we're connected to and the stories that, that reside there. It helps us to become stronger as, uh, as a community, as families, and as, a, uh, as an individual. And so it's wonderful to see these connections, and I'm very honored with that connection as well. And of course, all the, all the last names here, I'm thinking, well, that's my relatives right over there, right? And uh, again, it's important for us to, to reconnect with those things. So part of what I'm talking about today is reconnection, remembering, and reconciliation. And I'm talking about the uh, Kijikau Aski sacred land that we've spent quite a number of years uh, making happen. And it's something that's very dear to my heart, able to see it, um, uh, as I was saying to Laura just earlier, I said, it's about to learn how to walk on its own pretty soon. So I'm gonna have to learn how to let go and let it go off on its own in its own way. <laughs> and so, but this is a story about how we got there and where we are now. And from that, we can deduce what, where we're going to be afterwards. But it's, uh, it's a story that uh, will go back in time. I can't believe it, but yeah, almost 24 years. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a ways. Starting the project, we started in 2006, so it's too long. <laughs> but we felt that it really needed to happen. So anyhow, so uh, I want to share this story of, uh, of that sacred space that is uh, in the city that we've created uh, for uh, our people, but also how we've created it for Edmontonians as well, to make connection with us uh, as well. So next slide, please. Oh, you know what, I should tell you where I'm from, actually. I'm from Sucker Creek, uh, Cree First Nation out by uh, Lesser Slave Lake. Anybody from there? Okay. <laughs> it's like, I'll take a bus home tonight, but anyhow. Uh, 
but uh, I come from the Cardinal family, and that's another bunch of people that were in, in, uh, in your band, in your First Nation as well, a lot of Cardinals in there. Cardinals are like everywhere, right? And um, what's interesting is that I, because I've been involved in genealogy and trying to figure out uh, my family connections, which is, it's like we don't have a family tree, we have a family bush, right? Because we're just <laughs> connected in so many different ways, it's really quite, quite surprising, but also very powerful. And uh, so I'm working with uh, APGN right now, developing a, a, a TV series uh, uh, for them called uh, uh, Carry the Bundle, which is a story of the Cardinal family going all the way back to 1659. What's cool is people don't know that the Cardinal family name actually originates in Spain. And we can trace it back to 1492 there. And it's a, it's a Sephardic name, it's a Jewish name, is how it started, right? And then there's the whole story of how they went over the Pyrenees in 1492, when they were chased out of Spain, and then they find their way into France. And then 1659, the very first uh, French uh, Cardinal comes over, by the name of Simon Jean Cardinal comes over with his his wife, two sons, and an extended family, and they landed in Montreal, where there are only seven hundred and no two hundred and fifty people in Fort Ville Marie, it was called, which is now called Montreal, and uh, maybe three thousand Frenchmen in all of uh, New France at the time. So it is really at the very beginning of the when the first settlers came, and it's interesting to see the intersections of. Our extended family, not just the cardinal family, but all the extended families and how we intersect with history. So really, it's kind of like uh, an indigenous people's history of Canada through the lens of uh, uh, family ties and kinship ties. So uh, hopefully it will get the green light. I'm just waiting for that here and over the next couple of days and then we'll be on our way. But anyway, but it's it's about connecting with the uh, the history of, uh, of who we are, which again is a really important part. And that's why it's important for Edmonton to know the stories of our people who are here and the relations we had. And I did see the uh, presentation by Dylan Reed, uh, the, the filmmaker, uh, very in, it, impressive, impressive stuff. But it shows just how deeply connected this city is in its own history with Indigenous people through those bloodlines. And we have to remember that. In, in Quebec, for example, they, um, they, they estimate about 40% of Quebecois have uh, in, an Indigenous, uh, come from in, Indigenous people in one way or the other. Uh, what I just found out recently is about 50% of, uh, of uh, people in uh, Newfoundland have Indigenous uh, history in their bloodlines as well. So, you know, you're all surrounded by Indians, but it's a good thing. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's all about family at the end, right? So, <laughs> well, we are, right? And that's the thing is that we, you know, we, we have to start to see ourselves in the tradition of what the treaties teach us. The treaties teach us that they were, in so many of our traditions, adoption ceremonies, where one nation adopts another nation, and then you become like families, and we shall be like brothers and sisters. That's the essence and the original foundation of what Canada was uh, meant to become, but we've forgotten that story, and we've moved off into a different direction. But I think if we pull back in that direction, there's a lot of things that we can do to repair uh, a, a lot of the past. I'm getting sidetracked. Okay. So here's a really quick overview of um, the Indigenous relations and reconciliation journey, uh, as I call it. And just so that you know, reconciliation for me isn't, you know, a destination. It's the journey. It's how we have to move together. There's a lot of things in the past that still have to be answered for when you were doing your wonderful uh, uh, acknowledgement. One thing that, that I, I remember is that the railroads had a lot to do with the removal of the Papas Chase people from their lands as well. And that's a part of the story that needs to be brought back in there as well. Uh, <clears throat> so in uh, 1994, the city established this organization called the Edmonton Aboriginal Urban Affairs Committee. And it really was just comprised of uh, volunteer uh, indigenous uh, folks and non-indigenous folks at the time. Uh, with the original idea that they were to give direction and, and guidance to the city uh, and make recommendations for policy changes or program development and that sort of thing. I became uh, the chair of it in about 2004, 2003, 2004, and I realized immediately that 
I did not have a mandate, and neither did we have a mandate in terms of speaking for the indigenous people here in this community. And so we had to correct that. We had to go to the community and seek their guidance in terms of what it is would they want us to do as a committee. And so we did. So we went out to uh, our indigenous leaders, formal indigenous leaders, and then the what they call informal indigenous leaders, which are community leaders, and Muslims and Kukums. And, um, and we went to them and said, what can we do? How can we serve the community here in order to really move things forward in the way that we hope to see it? And so we went to everyone and they said, well, we need you to create a process in which our voices can come together so that we can determine what it is that we need to do as a collective of Indigenous people here. And so with those directions then, we began this, this um, process called the big long name, but it was called the Edmonton Urban Aboriginal Accord Relationship Agreement Process. <laughs> Put the, oh, my business card was this long, it's, you know. <laughs> And uh, so, <clears throat> so we said, okay, well, let's, um, let's start working towards that. And so we uh, convinced the, uh, the city that it was a good idea. And uh, we were quite uh, brazen in, in the sense that we had no money. You know, we didn't have any political influence, but we had to approach it in a way where we can introduce an indigenous worldview to uh, the powers that be that never really understood what that was in the first place. It meant a lot of shuttle diplomacy. It meant a lot of teas, a lot of coffees, a lot of dinners and lunches and, uh, and things like that. But we had to convince the city and the, the city managers particularly that this was a good idea, that the indigenous people in the city really wanted to come together in a common voice to identify issues and concerns and priorities for them, for ourselves, to give that direction. Then, then we had legitimacy as a committee at the time then to be able to say, okay, well, this is what the people want. This is what they said. So we created that, uh, that process and uh, we didn't have any money, of course. And so, but we did hear through our friends within the city, there's this $2 million is going to be moved from uh, from this account into another if it isn't spent. So we said, okay, well, this is what we'll do. So I went and made presentations to the city managers. They would meet like every month or, or so and, uh, and tell them, you know, we hear that you have some extra money and that's just kicking around, <laughs> you know, and, and I said, you know, we're also following our tradition. That means that we were using consensus and how we were gonna move forward. And I said, what I'm gonna put before you is a challenge that I will come to you four times, as is our tradition, and ask you for the release of those funds so we can go ahead and start to do our community advocacies, right? And so the first time, and I said, it, and it has to be consensus. That means all 12 of you have to agree that you will release it. If we don't have consensus, then we can't move forward. We have to have consensus. So I went to them once, no, two, no, third time, no. And here I'm starting to sweat at that point. And, uh, and then uh, on the fourth time, they said, okay, all right, we, uh, we'll do it with you. Okay, so we then we had to bring that decision over to City Hall. And then uh, I presented the same thing to City Hall as well. But to make a long story short, City Hall voted in favor for it unanimously to move forward with that. So we're able to take those funds and develop the Accord Relationship Agreement. The first thing we did was work with the city to draft the Edmonton, uh, the Edmonton uh, Declaration, strengthening relationships between the uh, city of Edmonton and the Aboriginal people in the city. And so it sets out its intent in terms of what the city wants to do. So that became our starting point. So that was the first document that became very important because it then gave direction and indication to all of the agencies and departments and programs that this is the direction now the city's starting to look and starting to turn. So then we went through a process of uh, communication. Uh, we went to, um, we had meetings, talking circles, again, using consensus as, as a decision-making process. And we went through that process in, in determining what it is that was important for us. And so 
through that process, we learned that uh, we knew what the, we became aware of what the uh, uh, indigenous people in the city here wanted. They set up 22, yeah, 22 priorities, issues, and concerns. We did our own research. We went back 30 years before that to see what other studies had done, because we've got so many studies done with indigenous people, right? And so we said, let's see what, what they said there. Let's come, come, uh, ask our community if these were relevant and what's missing, and then ask them what else do we see for the future? So one of the important things that came out of that is the recognition, and this came from the elders, is that they said, you know, instead of just creating a regular old agreement, like we're gonna increase employment by 25% and, you know, and this and that, uh, they said, what we should be doing is creating a relationship agreement first that becomes the center, becomes the, the campfire that keeps us all uh, together. So what are those priorities? <clears throat> So we developed the Edmonton Urban Aboriginal Accord Relationship Agreement. That then set out the principles of how we wanted to have a relationship with the city of Edmonton. The city of Edmonton had to approve that as well through consensus. They also, and then we had to approve it through our own consensus process. That means everything that we did in talking with the elders, talking with the community members, we went back and had our, had our meetings brought it back to the community for them to ratify and verify that is this what and then to ask the question do we have consensus and we said yes and so that was the first time for us in the city where we all looked in the same same direction and that made a difference because the 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 government all orders of government municipal federal and and provincial uh started to adjust their um, envelopes their funding envelopes so they said if you want money from our funding envelopes, then you have to address these 22 issues, priorities, and concerns if you want money from us to be served in this city. So what we learn from that is that when the people lead, the leaders follow. But we did it as one voice, and that's what brought the strength to the movement. So it became that movement to, to make the changes that, that, we, that we needed. So we have this document, you can find it on the um, Edmonton website, it's called Your City, Your Voice Report, and it's with appendices as well, because we saved every single word that, that was said to the questions and the priorities and stuff that were there, so that our people can see their voices reflected back to them, but also reflected within the policy and the directions that we wanted to go. And then that's the movement that we, we started to make. These two documents then became the foundation upon which policy and directives within the city started to change. We then went into various um, uh, things like the uh, Master Parks Plan and started to go to meetings in order to shift policy within those documents so that we can open up the river valleys, open up our, our parks for Indigenous youth use and celebration. And we did that together. So, but that's that was the secret to this whole thing is creating that policy change by moving through that process and then changing the fundamental um, uh, portions of, of uh, the city's policies and regulations in order to start to open things up. So here are some of the things that started to open up. Like we have the uh, memorandum with the Confederacy of Treaty Six First Nations. We have the memorandum with the Métis Nation of Alberta. Uh, the TRC report was hosted here in 2015. Uh, our final event was held here. And we have a, a number of different activities that the city started to support. So towards the end of uh, you know, a few years ago, we're seeing things like creating the indigenous procurement framework. Um, which is the first in Canada. We, we opened up the first Indigenous Relations Office in Canada as well. So we became the benchmark for uh, urban Indigenous relations across the country. The, the UN picked it up. The UN said, hey, this is great. And they had a big conference down in Santiago, Chile, and they invited us to come down because they noticed that there's a, a, lot, a migration of Indigenous people around the world going into urban centers. And nobody really had, you know, a big plan other than pushing them into ghettos and, and that sort of thing. So they said, okay, well, you guys seem to be doing something. Uh, let us know how you did it. And so, and then uh, now we're working, and now we have the City of Edmonton's Indigenous uh, Framework, which again is the first of its kind, but what it's done is that it is now focused on the staff, focused on administration in terms of 
how much they know about Indigenous people, how they work with Indigenous people, bringing in Indigenous processes in order to address these issues. No longer is it just top down, here's our best idea to change things. And through that process, right at about uh, 2006 is when we first went to the city and said, we need a place to pray. You know, we're the only people here in this city who have to leave the city in order to do our basics of ceremony, like sweat lodges, healing ceremonies. And it's difficult for our people because we have transportation issues. A lot of us just can't pick up and, and drive 100 kilometers away and go into sweat lodge and, and, and do these various uh, uh, healing ceremonies and things. They should be able to take a, 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 an ETS uh, down there or, a, well, that was pre-Uber, so, but anyway, so that you know so they can access it and so we uh, <clears throat> so we so we started that process and how it started originally well first of all let me say this is that the idea of needing a place to do our ceremonies has always existed in the city and so it's not a unique idea it's something that i think things finally aligned where it started to open up hearts and, and doors in order to make the changes that we needed and, but we had to do that front end work of starting to change the foundations of what the city rests on in terms of policies and regulations. And through it all, though, was ceremonial. Everything had to be ceremonial. And the elders were saying, and we still have to work towards um, that consensus. It's not enough just to get a, um, a general uh, agreement in terms of 50 plus 1 percent, but it, it has to be more. And so in 2006, there, there was a conference here called Healing Our Spirit Worldwide. And it's an international gathering of indigenous folks who are, who are working on addictions and healing programs, utilizing indigenous ways of addressing those issues. They had asked if I knew a place where we can do sweat lodges. Well, I was directing a program at the University of Alberta at the time. And uh, I was having sweat lodges that, down at what was called Fox Farms at the time. And uh, the Fox farm, the Fox family had owned the land down by uh, where White Mud Park is right now. And uh, the, they had dedicated the land back to the city after the uh, farmer and his wife had passed away, 1982 specifically. And uh, so the city had been using it mainly for Fort Edmonton's work when they were revamping stuff in there. And so it just became a kind of a catch all place. But that's where I was having a, a, a sweat lodges uh, for, for, for students at the university. And I said, well, and I was chairing the, the uh, affairs committee at the time. I said, well, I'll ask the city if we can use that. And they said, sure, fine, use it. So after the conference was done, then the elders who were chair, who were the elders council for healing our spirits worldwide said, well, why can't we uh, keep it for ourselves? <laughs> I said, hey, that's a great, that's a great idea. She goes, we know, that's why we want you to go and find out. <laughs> and so, <laughs> hence began my, uh, my love affair with, uh, with the site. So, so we wrote the first uh, uh, document, a discussion paper on it for the city in 2006. And uh, <clears throat> the resistance was quite uh, significant at first. It wasn't gonna happen, can't do this. There was always all these reasons why um, they didn't, didn't want to happen. But the elders, again, were saying, well, because we're going to be working with something sacred here, we have to we have to move in a sacred manner. We have to move with good intention. And because we'll get frustrated, we'll get angry, but because we're trying to connect to something sacred, we have to work on ourselves in order to do this. And they said, you watch. When we get into conflict with the city, we go into ceremony. We invite them into ceremony. And we have to do that a lot of times. The resistance was real. It was racist. It was, um, we were called Satanists, all kinds of different things. Uh, I, I learned about how cities can, can uh, slow walk things and uh, administrate you to death. Um, and so a lot of programs don't, don't go forward that way because of those administrative uh, barriers and things. But we had to keep moving forward and doing it in that good way in order to start that, that process. Uh, to, to really get underway with things. So it, it, it took that time to do it. And then a remarkable thing happened. That whole echelon of uh, administrative leaders retired pretty much at the same time. And then everything changed, and people who were supporting us underneath took over those roles and said, okay, let's start moving this forward. So it, it, it was uh, it's amazing for me still to think about how that that shift happened and why but 
What the key to it was, was relationship building. It was again, going person to person, telling the story, sharing, um, teaching them how to see themselves in our own story. And that's the power of stories is because once, once you see yourself in another person's story, that's where that first thread of relationship comes out and you can pull on it until you, until you eventually build a bridge. But it took that time and it took the patience um, of Job, I guess I can say, and everybody, everybody gets that one, yeah. And so um, in, order to, in, in order to build what we needed to do. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and so, so it became, we wanted to go to some basic principles in terms of how we were moving forward. And of course, going to the, to the, the spirit of uh, peace, friendship, and respect was a, a foundational element to it in order to move forward. So that's how we approached with everything that we did in order to build this initiative as a joint effort between the Indigenous Knowledge and Wisdom Center and the city of Edmonton. Credit is due though to how we started it in, in, back in 2006, where we, we had to put together a, one of the stumbling blocks that was presented to us is that we have to, we have to uh, create a nonprofit organization in order to uh, move things through their channels to receive funds to do various things. And so we created the Indigenous uh, Cultural Resource Circle Society of Edmonton. I don't know what's with the big names, but uh, it worked. And so, uh, <laughs> they do, don't they? <laughs> and, uh, and so we, uh, so we started that. And then after a while, we, um, uh, the city said, well, we need to have an organization that uh, that has capacity to take on this project because now they're dead serious in, in making this happen. So we brought the project over to Native Counseling Services of Alberta. And so they, they then started to work on it. When we first, uh, <clears throat> we also had to ask the question, and this was in about 2010, 2011, is do the elders think this is a good idea? Because if the elders are saying, well, no, we're not going to have any ceremonies in the city, then, you know, we're, we've defeated ourselves. Uh, and so we said, okay. And again, we talked the city into sponsoring a, a gathering. We said 40 elders from the region. And uh, so that way we can have this dialogue. Are we doing the right thing? Three questions. One is that should we be having, um, should we be having ceremonies in the city? Because that was a contentious question at the time. And, and the community was split on that. Uh, half felt that no, we shouldn't be having ceremonies in the city at all because our things are sacred, et cetera, et cetera. But the other half was saying, no, this is where we need to be doing ceremonies because they said, this is where our people are going to be in the future. Most of our people are going to be in urban centers. And uh, <clears throat> so um, we asked those three questions. We invited 40 elders from the Edmonton area, 108 showed up from all across Alberta. I'll never forget that that morning, wide-eyed city folks coming in. There's 108 elders signing up. What are we going to do? They said, well, you know, we don't have the money in the budgets for it. So, so we, so I called up the mayor uh, at the time, and I, I said, listen, we have this situation. You know, I said I can't turn them away. You know, and so we have to take care of their mileage, their food, their accommodations. <laughs> So I says, Louis, do you think this is worth it? And I said, oh, yeah. I said, this, this has to happen. It's an important question or important set of questions. And he, he said, okay, I'm giving the green light on it. So we did get the 108 elders there for three days. And, uh, and for three days, they sat and they talked in, about these questions and did, and did ceremony. And that's when they came away with those, uh, those points. It's, it's time. It's time that we, that we do this. And it's time that we uh, start to really create that, that space for, for our people and that we are in the cities and we will be in the cities even more. So we need the space. It's our responsibility in this generation to create that for the generations to come. And so we did do that. And then the second question uh, was, well, what type of ceremonies should we be having uh, in the city? And they said, okay, well, they said not all the ceremonies, not like a sun dance and vision quest. They said, we still want those done out in the, in the communities, out in the other places where they, where they belong. You go, but the other ones, various healing ceremonies, uh, sweat lodges and different uh, types of ceremonies can be, can be done here. And then the final question was, where should we be having it in the city? And they, you know, and they said, well, we don't want to see uh, sweat lodges in Walmart parking lots and, and those sorts of things, right? And they said, you know, it has to be in a place that's still embraced by, by Mother Earth. 
And so we found uh, three different locations, um, one of which the, the city is really gracious and say, we'll give you 40 acres, but it's out of town. And I said, well, <laughs> that defeats the purpose, isn't it? You know, it's, we need to have it in, in town. We need to have it close to downtown. So we presented the, uh, uh, the Fox Farms uh, as a location. And so uh, then the elder said, yes, this will be a good place because it's close. You can take a bus to it. It's, um, it's quite central and it's right by the river and it's right, right beside White Mud, uh, uh, White Mud Creek. So they said it'll work. So <clears throat> that's when we started to really uh, started to move on. It was getting that uh, really put together. And we had a, uh, uh, we put together then uh, the Kijikau Elders Council to, to begin to continuously guide us and set the protocols to ensure that we were following our protocols, our cultural, ceremonial, and spiritual protocols to do this uh, the right way and the proper way. And so they're still with us. The, um, yeah, the eight that we, ha eight, nine uh, that we originally started with, one retired uh, and one actually had passed away. So there's seven, but um, so they continue uh, to guide us. So the, um, the whole project itself cost $6.5 million and the city put all the money into it. You know, it was kind of, I was teasing the mayor about that. I said, yes, yeah, and you're going to build it because he was a good friend of mine. <laughs> and I said, and you guys are going to pay for it too. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the province and, and the federal government didn't put any money into it whatsoever. And we had asked them uh, a, a couple times uh, to help out and they just turned us down uh, flat. So the city has, has put this up. Uh, so well, you can say Edmontonians had put this up uh, for us. And so uh, next slide, please. And so this is the site. I don't know how many ha have been there, but you can see the White Mud Creek that is there. Um, the White Mud Drive, Fort Edmonton Park is over there, and that's the land base that we're building on now. So it's accessible, and particularly the elders wanted it to be uh, uh, central for Indigenous youth and families to be able to access their, uh, their cultural resources. And uh, it's a place also where Edmontonians can learn about the traditions and the history uh, of our people. And also to, to uh, reestablish relationship and connection to ceremony and the land. And the land is so important, um, not only for Indigenous people, but for human beings, period. You know, we are the land and the land is us. And so if we don't remember that connection, we walk out of balance. And that's the thing with human beings is that we tend to fall out of balance quite quite easily because of the type of creature that we are. That's why ceremonies were created, to pull us back into balance, pull us back into harmony with our environment, but also with each other as well. And so, but also it is about reconnecting relationship to your past, your history, to, to your families, uh, to the relations that you have that, that's around you. So that became a very central uh, process, uh, part of it was having those families there connecting to each other in the relations that we need to to reconnect with and relationships that we need to refortify with ourselves because as we know today we can see a lot of isolation a lot of uh, segregation politically re religiously everything else and um, and we're losing that connection with each other so we started to uh, develop the uh, natural space but also it's become a place for uh, education. We're doing a lot of land-based education down there now and, uh, and a lot of special gatherings. We had our first wedding there just two weeks ago. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we're, uh, we're it's, start, it's starting to shape itself in the way that it needs to be and responding to the people in a very interesting way. Uh, next slide, please. Yep, yeah. and so this is just a quick overline of, of what I was uh, sharing with you and the capital funding and all that sort of stuff. But in uh, 2019, then NCSA in 2017 had said, had reorganized themselves and they said, listen, we're going to hand this off to another organization. And they had asked for recommendations and said, well, the Indigenous Knowledge and Wisdom Center would be a good choice. And the reason for that is because the IKWC was created by all the chiefs of Alberta and uh, to develop educational um, uh, tools, curriculum, programs, projects to support all First Nation schools across the province. 
but also in relationship to uh, the public and the Catholic school systems that are here and also our post-secondary institutions. So we have those relationships uh, with them. And then so in 2009, uh, then they signed um, a relationship agreement with uh, the city of Edmonton. And that's when things really started to go really quickly. So we did our, our solstice, um, in the fall solstice of 2021, we did our ground blessing before construction started. And it's not that we were blessing the ground, actually, what it was, is that if you can see up there, it's just towards the end of COVID time. And we can only have like 10 people meeting in a, in a certain space. And, uh, and so that's why there's a sparse amount of people. You can see Mayor Iveson up there, who is a great champion for this. I must say, the all of city council stood behind this project uh, all the way it's through. And uh, even during the times when the administration was fighting with uh, city Council, they, they still uh, stood behind st stood behind the project and every time we'd come to them because i've learned a lot about working with the city and contra contracting and that. Uh, you know costs seem to go up quite quite rapidly, so I was always going back <laughs> doing the presentations to uh, city Council to say okay we'll just need another million dollars and we'll be okay, you know. I did that three times, I think. Uh, anyway, but here we are. So this is the ground blessing uh, ceremony. What we did is that we gave uh, ribbons, which uh, you have you have some, and uh, these ribbons uh, represent the four directions and also the color green for Mother Earth. And so all of us that were in that circle were given tobacco and uh, and these these color ribbons. If you want to share it really quickly. And so we all stood there with the tobacco and the ribbons in our left hand, and then we said, this is what we see for the future of Kichikawaski. This is why we think it's important. This is what we see happening here. We weren't talking to each other, we were talking to uh, Mother Earth. When we um, started that ceremony up there, it was just foggy all over the place. But by the time we were just finishing, the sun just came out and somebody took a nice picture uh, of it. But uh, and the elders are saying that's that's a good sign. So you can see we have gifts because we gave everyone gifts, and then we took the uh, ribbons and the tobacco and brought them out to a sacred uh, white poplar tree where we then, we still have them hanging there to keep us reminded about what pledges and promises we did and and explain to Mother Earth why we were there and why we were about to disturb the land and we needed it for for the children for the youth for future generations etc uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, and then construction uh, started uh, just like a month, less than a month after this. And then it was done a year later. And then we had our, uh, in spring, in March of last year, exactly a year next week, we opened it up softly so that we can start to do ceremonies and things and kind of learn, kind of like kick the tires, I guess you can say, take it out for a drive, figure out how it works, uh, those sorts of things, go through the deficiencies uh, processes and all that. Um, and then uh, we uh, had our fall solstice official openings on, on in 20, just last, uh, last September. So that opened it up there. Take a, a, next, a next slide, please. So overall, we had 170 indigenous elders that we sought counsel from uh, to do this. We had two grand councils uh, of elders that we brought together to have input on, on protocols and what they saw happening down there. Unfortunately, we held it at the uh, Alfred Savage Center. Uh, we have to work on that name. And so <clears throat> it's kind of, it's kind of weird, eh? Just like, but it's what it's called. Uh, and so we're working on it though. <laughs> so, so so we, so we did have, <laughs> uh, anyhow, I, I can go on with that. Um, but we, uh, uh, IKWC then signed a license agreement uh, in, in March, our formal license agreement with it to operate it for the next five years with, with a renewal um, built into it. But we're also working on a couple things. There's a longer term um, operating agreement, um, but also to have that land dedicated in perpetuity for indigenous ceremonies and ceremonial ground so because organizations don't last forever forever either but that land still needs to be pledged uh, to our people so we're working on that uh, agreement now and uh, and then the uh, the the city uh, became great partners and uh, believe me we got into a lot of conflict and we had to be reminded by the elders you know don't choke anyone 
go into ceremony. And that's what we had to do. And uh, but we brought them with us. And then they started to really understand what we were talking about in, in a different way. And so but that's a kind of process that it, that it took again, just to recommit ourselves on on again, because as human beings, again, we're, we're, we're faulty, we, we, we tend to lose patience and, uh, and get very protective and, and all those sorts of things. So there's a way in which to do it. One of the things, and they, they will do the maintenance, so they, they're doing the, the main maintenance in the area, but we have our responsibilities are within uh, the segments of, with inside the, uh, uh, the grounds themselves, and I'll show that to you in a minute, but, uh, and then also uh, things inside the buildings uh, are our responsibility. So we do have, you know, um, uh, different roles that we, we take care of, but the city's been very kind and generous to, uh, to be able to provide us with services and things like, like snow removal is, is really important and, and that sort of stuff. So what we did as well is we became a, a test site for the uh, indigenous procurement strategy that they're working on. They haven't rolled it out totally yet. They're still in the drafting process. They're almost done with it. But what we did is that we then built in a process in which indigenous um, contractors can apply or can bid into um, on, on the various aspects of the uh, of, of the contracts uh, one uh, case and example is that we have uh, solar arrays on top of the uh, on top of the buildings and uh, we had uh, we selected a um, an indigenous uh, uh, entrepreneur who had a solar um, solar business a really good one too as it turned out and he comes from beaver lake beaver lake first nation and so we hired him, put it up, perfect, looks after it, everything. So just those sorts of things, 60% of our staff or the, uh, uh, the laborers and the workers, uh, construction workers were, were Indigenous. We worked with an Indigenous staffing uh, company. And uh, so we were able to bring in Indigenous workers in it. And, uh, and we were involved with a bid, a bid evaluation. So there was uh, myself and uh, another elder, and uh, we were able to sit at the table with the rest of the uh, city uh, people and make arguments for or against and study and see who was, who was best. We didn't select every single Indigenous file that uh, came forward or application. We were looking for the best and the, and the qualified. But that really helped to shape uh, a procurement strategy. And now they took you know, some of the bones of what we uh, experienced and started to turn it into this, uh, into this uh, procurement strategy. So now creating processes for indigenous uh, contractors with everything the city uh, has to do, a way in which they can access those, those contracts like everyone else. One of the larger issues that that we have within our communities, we don't know how to access those uh, those doors, you know, or or to be informed of uh, of opportunities. So those are some of the things that we had to had to remove, and also provide support for uh, for these applicants or for these bids, so that they can do it in a way that the city can you know read and, and go through um, uh, and and uh, make them uh, viable uh, contractors. Next slide, please. And so. You know, the farmland really is, uh, we're learning so much about it. The history of the place is really quite, quite interesting. We started to, stories started to come to us from, from elders um, as far north as uh, Lubicon Lake, down to the Pekinese people in uh, southern Alberta, and the Siksika people, they have history of stopping by that place. And uh, they stopped by there because there was ochre, Ochre is a very sacred um, item for us. And it's a ferric oxide is the, uh, is the scientific name for it. And um, we would crush it. We used to also call it paint in our own language, right? Because we used to use it all, all the time. And if you look at paintings like with Gatlin and Paul Kane and that, they paint Cree warriors. They usually would put red, red on them and, and that sort of stuff. So it is very important and to find a huge load of it just across the creek about uh, 20 30 meters uh, it's a huge tufa i think it's about maybe two to three hundred meters long we don't know how deep it is what we do know and there's a spring that's there that that comes out of the side that's still depositing uh, ochre in, in that area the locals have known about it for a long time the locals used to call it the, the red mud or where the red mud meets the white mud and uh, <clears throat> and so 
so listening to the Siksika and the Pekini, they were talking about the, the ochre, and they said, oh yeah, we'd come down to the fort, we'd trade, but when we go home, we'd stop by there and take some of it back home with us, right? And, uh, uh, geez, people coming out from, uh, like, the uh, Ochis people, they remember, Peter Ochis was sharing this story with us when, when he was alive, and he was talking about how he remembers stopping there, and they'd camp there and get ready for... Uh, or coming into the city or the town here to do trade. So he remembers all you know, the, the various berries and there was a lot of medicine down there, he said. And so, and there still is actually. Um, and so these stories started to present themselves, which we found to be very fascinating. We also found out that uh, that spring has been running since 11,900 years ago, at the end of the very end of the last ice age. That's how old that, that site is. And uh, so, starting to find these stories and hear what the elders had to say and finding some scientific history about it we we said you know this land is confirming itself for us even more next slide please and so the white mud itself um, is uh, also a very important part of indigenous uh, ceremonial traditions as well and some of the uh, plains traditions uh, plains creed traditions what they would do in the old days is that when a young lady was coming of age, they'd set up a teepee and inside on the floor, they would put down the white mud. And the white mud would be caked on the floor and then she'd go in there in ceremony for four days. And then the elder women and them would teach her songs and do ceremonies and various things for four days. And then she, on the fourth day, she brought out and presented to the, to the nation as a, a new woman of the nation ceremony. So it's at that rite of passage. Uh, they used to use it for various ceremonial mounds for, for ceremonies, holding pipes, holding sacred items, those sorts of things. So the white mud was important. It was uh, James, uh, Dr. James Palliser who named the white mud, uh, the white mud ravine and the white mud creek because of all that white mud was there. Fort Edmonton used to come down and take the white mud and turn it into paint and paint the fort white. That's where they got the paint before they actually got paint coming in from the, from the east. So it has a lot of significance uh, to it, just the white mud itself. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the ochre deposit that I was telling you about, right? And this is only a couple of pictures, but this is from like last spring and last last uh, fall. So you can see, like there's a big stone that was pushed over and you can see all that dark ochre in there. So ochre ranges in color from yellow all the way to a dark brown. And uh, just doing a bit of research on it, it's quite amazing in terms of what, what you can do with it and the different colors you can get from it. But we use, we use it as red as a primary color. And a lot of indigenous people, uh, they call them the circumpolar, uh, circumpolar peoples as an ancient name, uh, uh, used ochre uh, quite a bit for, for their ceremonies and stuff. They're finding a lot of uh, graves up in uh, Alaska, and bluefish caves and around that area where, where bodies are buried and they're all painted in ochre. Um, Neanderthals used to use ochre uh, as well. So it's a very deeply connected thing with human beings. But there it is. So we go to the city and we say, listen, we want to offer stewardship over that site so that we can turn it into a, a teaching place and a ceremony place and protect it a bit more. Not to cut it off from everyone, but just to, because the one thing that COVID did is that it, it had people rediscover the, uh, the river valley. Right, and so just more and more people were coming out. So we started to notice there's degradation uh, going on. So we, we need to do something just to bring a bit more respect uh, to the site. But the water is still running. The ochre, as you can see, is being deposited still. And these are this is a part of the tufa that I was, I was telling you about. So it's, it's, really, it's really quite deep. So that spring goes down quite a ways because Springs, well, you have kind of two forms of springs, I guess you could say, in the area. One is where you have groundwater that sits up top and then goes down and then comes out like at a riverbank. Uh, then you got water that's really down deep, you know, a few hundred feet. And then that's because it's warmed by Mother Earth. It comes up and this doesn't freeze. As you can see, um, because it's warm, it eventually freezes once it gets outside, but it doesn't freeze um, and stop. It continues to run uh, year round. So again, another indication that the site that we chose is uh, is important and it has a lot of significance. Next slide, please. We also found these um, buffalo horns, uh, buffalo bones, a big femur, and uh, a horseshoe, 
<laughs> but uh, we uh, we were digging, a we were removing all the old piping and stuff that the farmer had put down for various things, and we had to dig down and remove them, replace them with something else. And we were down about two meters. And usually, I mean, the law is that if you dig down below a meter, you have to have an indigenous observer, you have to have a, a geo person, a geological person, and you have to have an anthropologist observing to see what they're 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 building, uh, what they're digging out, <clears throat> and then they'll stop, they'll pile it off to the side, and then you go and then you look through it, make sure we don't we don't miss anything. And so we we found uh, this is just some of the buffalo bones. It's not all of them that we found, but these horns are really quite remarkable because they're still fully intact. And and the anthropologist he he was uh, he was saying he thinks they're around three to five thousand years old, right? So they're very they're very old. And as, as you probably know, the buffalo is a very important uh, symbol for us. And to have a a grandfather buffalo with horns there uh, come out of the ground is something that really Again, first thing I do is run out there, put tobacco and say, thank you. And so we then, now it's, uh, they're just finishing the, the studying of it and uh, they're gonna give it back to us, but they're, we're gonna put it in a nice box and, and then keep it, uh, keep it there to remind us, you know, we're connecting again with, uh, with what's important to us. So the land again is starting to present itself to us. Uh, next slide. And so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, like I say, it was 16 years uh, long but uh, it's always worth the investment, even if one generation is to give its time for the other generations to, uh, to benefit from it. So I'm gonna stop using the 16 year thing and just say, it just took a long time and you know, <laughs> it's here now, I'm not gonna complain anymore. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. I think I talked about this already. Um, yeah. So the consultation I was talking about, so we had the uh, different uh, meetings at the Alfred H. Savitt Center. And uh, so we had uh, oh, 70, almost 70 uh, folks involved with that one there. Um, and then we had uh, all involved in the schematic design. So we had the designs, we had the ideas based upon um, the architectural maquettes that we went through and about what would be down there, how big things would be and, and that sort of thing. And the elders didn't want it to be a huge, massive building, right? They said, because really we should be outside because that's a whole point of, of what we're trying to do. I mean, there's things that we need, but um, we don't need a huge building to uh, do what we, what we need to do. So it was really great, again, to work with the elders and to work with uh, the city in order to start this design process and everything. Next slide, please. And here's our, uh, so Native Counseling Services pulled together the Council of Elders. Some of these names you guys might know. Uh, Howard Mustus is the chair. He's from uh, Alexis. Uh, uh, Fred Campion is from uh, Treaty 8. Uh, he used to be Campio, but he's Campion now. And uh, Will Campbell, um, Annabelle Kootenay, uh, Beatrice Morin, Emil De Rocher, uh, Wilson Bearhead, and, uh, and Joe Grout. And so now the, the chiefs want us to open it up a bit more to uh, bring in proper representation from the treaty areas and the, and the Métis Nation and that sort of thing. So we're working on that now. Next one, please. And so this is the original designs in terms of what it looks like. So pretty much it's the same thing here. So this is called phase one. So we had to build, rebuild the road and then we built a parking lot. So we got 46 uh, parking stalls, angled parking stalls. We got two bus, uh, length bus parking stalls and a turnaround area and we have an amphitheater we have our what we call the Kajikalaski pavilion um, which is where we have the meeting room in and then we have our um, teepee and gathering circles that light green circle to the right the bottom left green uh, right green circle is our sweat lodge area and I'll tell you a little story about that too but uh, so that's that's what we're doing now. Phase two and phase three, really, we put these in only because we knew things are going to change. We don't know what we'll need in the future, but we said, okay, let's create an opportunity just at least to say we will need more things in the future, like a, a medicine garden, um, a flexible space to build other, uh, other types of ceremonial lodges, like longhouses and, and various things like that. But that all depends on those nations and what they want to build down there, because this is open for all indigenous nations. There's 67 indigenous nations in Canada with unique customs, traditions, and languages, uh, and they do things differently. And so we have to make sure that we create that space. Well, we acknowledge this is Treaty 6 uh, territory, traditional Plains Cree territory. We also recognize that Edmonton is home to pretty much 
every indigenous nation in Canada, somebody from those nations live here in Edmonton. So we always have to make sure there's room. And like you said, when you open this up, that's the wow, you're welcome here, there's room. So we wanna keep that uh, alive as well. Next, uh, next one, please. The two buildings, uh, that's the amphitheater. The green patch is a slow, you'll see some pictures of this. Place to put our teepee poles and our, and our uh, uh, canvases for our teepees and tents, tool shed, a, a wood shed we're calling to keep wood dry. And then we have to the right is our pavilion. We have two changing rooms in there. We have three uh, barrier free non gendered washrooms. We have then the gathering space with seats 40. And we'll, we'll see some real live pictures of it in a second. Next, please. So this is. Uh, the construction has been completed and we signed the agreement in March. And so this is what it looks like from the outside. So this is the pavilion. And uh, next slide, please. Then that's the hallway inside. To the left are the uh, changing rooms or the locker rooms. And to the right are the uh, three washrooms. And if you look at that interesting panel there, it uh, <clears throat> all the doors are, are accessible uh, for, for people who have mobility issues. Or if you're carrying two, Two coffees and a piece of bannock, you can use your knee. <laughs> Opens that really well. I, I discovered that myself. Oh, somebody told me about it. I mean, <laughs> next, please. So there are the Barry Fear washrooms, and there's the uh, one of the changing rooms, 25 lockers, like I said there. So you go in there, and the door closes, and there's another red panel. You push that, and it locks it, and that little light comes on there and says that it's being occupied. Uh, next one, please. So this is the um, the pavilion room. So we have ten uh, tables and forty chairs, and it's quite quite comfortable for that amount uh, of people in there. And you'll look at the lights up there. <clears throat> the others uh, were pointing out that the reason why we have the lights like that is because it represents the hand drums of different nations, right? The medicine drums uh, for healing. And um, the, what you can't see here, those, these windows also have roll shutters that come down and lock up so for really good security, but it also makes it really dark inside because a lot of our ceremonies also require a really dark space. So we can do like night lodges and other types of ceremonies in there. And we can have, we've had pipes, our very first ceremony had in there with 30 lawyers sitting, uh, sitting in a circle there. I thought something was gonna catch on fire, but we're lucky. Anyway, but we had, <laughs> We had uh, 30, 30 lawyers, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, <clears throat> anyhow, but the floors are also heated, so you can sit on there without it being cold, yeah, so we had a glycol system going through to make, make it nice and comfy, yeah, next, uh, just another angle with it, we have a 75 inch uh, uh, TV, uh, Wi-Fi access, cable access, great for conferences and things, you know, don't watch hockey. I, that's what I, you know, we, we say no, no hockey. Um, and then of course we have a, uh, uh, a, a simple counter. We tried to get a, uh, a, a kitchen built there, but they wouldn't allow us because, and, and we wanted showers, but they wouldn't allow us to have showers as well because we're building in a nature reserve. And I guess the, the certain policies kind of turn it into a habitat, right? Or a, a potential of someone moving in and living there, I guess, but they're seeing it different now. So yeah, we're not asking for much, just something to keep the, the stew warm. Um, next. So this is our uh, storage uh, facility. And so this is the big storage area. This is where we're keeping our teepee poles and stuff in there. Just to give you an idea of how, how long it is. Then those two doors off to the left there are, are, are the tool shed. We got a golf course, a golf course. I mean, a, a golf cart. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, it's, it's a putting range. Right? No, no, it's a, it's a tool shed with a golf cart in it that we can move elders around in. Yeah, yeah. Oh, geez. Phase three. No. <laughs> And that's our that's our our our, our woodshed there. <laughs> Next, <laughs> change the subject here. Uh, <clears throat> so this is our sweat lodge. Um, these are sweat lodge encounters. We'll have another picture in a second. But when I, yeah, just we'll stop it right there. The uh, uh, when we were about to build this, uh, an elder woman had asked if she could come down and see uh, this uh, the sweat site that we had at the time. And the fire enclosure, because the fire department uh, said, you, we can't approve this site unless you show us a fire safety plan. Fine, that's fair. Um, but they said you have to enclose 
uh, the fires. And I said, well, the fires are only like about four feet wide. They're not really large things. Said, well, still, we need a fire plan. We want, you to, we want you to demonstrate to us what kind of fire enclosure you have. So we designed this. But prior to that, we were having sweat lodges while construction was going on. <clears throat> and we built a, a square fire enclosure with one door on it. And we built a south-facing sweat lodge. Uh, south facing mean, meaning the door faces south and so an elder woman said I want to come and see it if I can use it and she came over and she goes I, I can't use this and I said well why she said well because first of all the sweat lodge is facing south I have a sweat that faces southwest a door that faces southwest and she said all you have is one door facing north she goes I can't use that and she said and where's the woman's fire right and I said oh so we'll leave it to men to design things and totally left out the, the women's. But I said, I promise you, we'll, we'll make the changes. So we did. And because of that conversation, this is what we came with. We designed this eight doors, because if you have a sweat lodge that faces south or yeah, faces south, you have to have an alignment with that, with the, uh, the rock pit inside the sweat lodge, the sweat lodge door, and then the fire pit, and then that direction. And you have to have it open. It's like a spirit road, right? So you have to have that open. But not all people who hold sweat lodges have their doors facing south. They have them in all these other directions as well. So that's why we had to create this with eight doors. So when you have a sweat lodge and, you, and, you, and you're about to go do the ceremony part of it, then you can open those two doors, the north and the south, and you get that alignment. And the same thing with the other directions as well. It is open, yeah. It's they're, they're hard to keep closed. Oh no, you don't sweat in there. That just heats the that just heats the fire, the the rocks. Yeah, it's just a fire enclosure around it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't well in here. You don't see uh, the sweat lodges aren't aren't in this because we hadn't built them yet. We just built our first one uh, last uh, the beginning of October, and so it's a southwest facing gar. Uh, and so um yeah yeah so that's just for the fire so we don't burn down the the nature reserve right that's what the fire department was really worried about and they were really gave us uh very rigid about that you know it's a, a fire department you have a question no 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 that's just a fire enclosure yeah just like a fire pit you know it's not there yet not in this pictures yet yeah <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're, we just built our first one. Yeah, this is just a patsy. And then they put in this gravel stuff around. They compacted it really hard. So we had our first lodge built. And the elder said, I'm not going to build it on that gravel pit. I'm going to build it on the grass. And so that's, that's what he did. He went and built it on the grass. Now the city was there. And I was there with the city architect. And she, she goes, how come he's not building it on the, on the gravel pad? And I said, well, I said, because it's, it, it's, it just doesn't work. It's too hard. It'll turn into a mud pit inside, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so, um, so now they're going to remove the gravel, right? And they're going to sod it in this, this spring. So we'll be <laughs> up and running soon. But again, just again, it shows how the relationship changes and then eventually the rigidity of what they had kind of starts to be more fluid, right? So that's our sweat lodge uh, site area. Uh, next slide, please. And so we have our amphitheater. And of course, just to give you some perspective on, on, on the size of it, we put about 150 people uh, in there really quite, uh, quite comfortably. It's grassed. Again, sitting on the land is really important. Next, please. Uh, yeah, it's a better picture of it. So, that, just the, uh, the, so we told them, OK, we'll build the, the fire enclosure for the sweat lodges, but we need a, a four-foot fire pit. And they said, oh, OK, and they approved that. It's four feet exactly as big as our fire is in our sweat lodges and didn't have to build anything around it. It's don't know why. Well, we said, okay, we'll take it. And then we ran. So, uh, so this, yeah, just kind of gives you a perspective. And this is an 18 foot teepee that, that you see there. Next one, please. And so here's just some perspective angles. So you're looking north and, uh, and, and uh, uh, west. And you can see the creek there and everything. Next one, please. And then you're looking south and east. You can see the white mud banks and that. And you can see the solar arrays on the, uh, on the buildings. So the, where the teepee is, we just simply call that the teepee slash gathering circle. So you can put all kinds of different things on there and use it for different events and activities. We had a 70 foot by 30 foot big top on there for our grand opening ceremony. Lots of room. And of course, you can see pathways and, and things like that. 
and you got two little people standing, not little people, I mean, but you have two individuals standing over there that kind of gives you a perspective on it. Uh, forget the cultural differences, right? Yeah, word choice. Uh, go ahead, please. Next. Yeah, and this is looking towards uh, downtown. And we took this uh, last uh, last summer and uh, it was a bit, a bit smoky, but it kind of gives you a sense of the scale of it. And then you can see the Savage Center across over there. And uh, next, next slide, please. So this is uh, our fall 2023 sol uh, solstice official opening ceremonies and open house and a prophecy fulfilled. I was, speak I was invited to go speak uh, in Melbourne, Australia last February uh, to tell them what we were doing here because they wanted to do a similar thing. So we had this uh, big presentation with uh, city planners, uh, urban designers, indigenous elders, and uh, to tell them about the story of Kichikawaski. And one of the things that they found interesting was ochre, because the ochre for the uh, uh, Australian indigenous people is a very sacred thing as well. So at the end of the, the, um, the, the uh, presentation, an indigenous elder came to me and he presented two pieces of uh, ochre. He said, I want to give you these. He goes, this one, he said, you keep for yourself. This one, he said, I want you to take, and I want you to go bring it to that ochre site and bury it there. He said, because what's going to happen is you're going to create a storyline between your place there and us over here. And he said, and then what you're going to see, he says, our people will then come and we'll dance with you, we'll celebrate with you, and we'll do ceremony with you. There's an Aboriginal group that came for the opening. And so they, uh, you see him right in the middle, the, the gentleman is Mugi Sumner. And, uh, and he, had, he was at the Healing Our Spirits Worldwide conference last year in, in, uh, uh, in, in Vancouver. And so he said, well, we don't want to come back home right now. He says, do you have any activities or events we can do in Edmonton? And I said, well, you know, there's, we were just like 10 days away from our opening ceremonies. I said, why don't you come celebrate, dance, and do ceremony with us? <laughs> so they did. So they came and they did exactly what uh, that elder had prophesied to back it was a prophecy. It was only seven months long, but it was still a prophecy, right? <laughs> Next one, please. And so here are some of the things that we were doing last summer. Just just a couple. Uh, bow making. Um, uh, Elder uh, Jerry Saddleback uh, led that, brought in uh, a bunch of young people and, and uh, showed them how to make some traditional bows. And next. And uh, intro to moose hide tanning and fleshing. So you can see all these young people and families, and they're really learning how to how to work with uh, with hides. And so we've had we had two other uh, hide tanning um, uh, camps last uh, last summer. Next, please. And this is a real quick overview of our uh, of our governing uh, process here. I tried to build it as a uh, like a medicine lodge, right? Everybody has a role in, in ceremony. And so you have the city of Edmonton and the Alberta Chiefs Roundtable on Education. They are they are the uh, leaders. They are the ones who uh, are really the, the the high level partners on this. Then you have the Indigenous Relations Office, and then you have the Indigenous Knowledge and Wisdom Center. We do the heavy lifting, and uh, <clears throat> and so we have the White Mud Integrated Park Stewardship Committee. That that consists of all the partners of the uh, uh, of the. Uh, sites and locations around us. So we all come together and we meet and we just inform each other as to what's going on. We ask each other for advice and guidance. Uh, uh, Fort Edmonton, for example, is a part of that. The Equine Center is a part of that. And they become great partners with us because if we need extra parking, we can park over at uh, Fort Edmonton, no charge or anything like that. So uh, a really great committee and we meet maybe once every four months. And then we have our community partner circle, and that's really bringing together more of the organizations and institutions who are starting to use the site. Again, we're just constructing that now, but the intent is to, to bring these organizations together so we can continue to ask questions and seek guidance and, and uh, so forth, and how we can improve things and that sort of thing. So we have that continuous connection with the broader community. And then to the right is the Kichikawaski Elders Council, which I had talked about before. 
and then the working group, uh, which is IRO and IKWC. So it's all of the staff, we then come together and we kind of keep on top of each other in terms of what we're doing, what's coming up. So we're always in constant uh, contact uh, with each other. Then in the center, of course, is the uh, principles and the uh, those traditional values of, of partnership, which holds us together, that seeks that balance and we go back to that image of the fire that's what keeps us warm is those those principles and keeps us keeps us together and we have to rely on that to help guide us through through difficult times so it becomes those guiding principles and and relationship commitments that we have to each other and of course then it connects us to the uh, to the great mystery to the creator next so when construction was done we um we gathered all of the the workers uh, together, everyone who had anything to do with it, uh, construction workers, contractors, all, 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 the, all the folks you can think of. And then we gathered them in a circle and then we sang for them and we presented them these medicine gifts, which those ribbons, again, we gave all of them copies of those ribbons because those ribbons are on that tree. So it connects you uh, to the place. And so there's a lot of these contractors are still talking about it. They said we've never ever experienced anything like that or ever got that kind of appreciation for. And they feel that they did put their energy into the place, but we wanted to honor that because we knew it. And that just brings, you know, it makes our circle bigger, makes our circle stronger as well. Next. And so <clears throat> continuing in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Again, Toronto is called Winnipeg, Saskatoon, Calgary, Red Deer, Fort Saskatchewan, Melbourne, Australia, where people are asking, well, how did you do this? We want to do the same thing as well. So we're providing guidance and direction for them. The elders really saw far enough to say that we hope that all the cities across Canada will do the same thing, because we want to inspire them to help support their Indigenous uh, peoples. Uh, as well. So we are getting the calls. Lieutenant Governor uh, uh, Salma Lakani uh, is now wants to create a heart and medicine garden honoring those children that were lost in our residential schools. So that's something that we're starting to work on now. The Rotarians are, are really excited about uh, working on the, the project as well. And then just phase two, here's additional things that we need. We need more administration. We need administration space. We don't have any down there. Um, so we're thinking of like a, a tiny home office, like a, they call it a garden studio office, just so a place where our workers can have a, a desk and, and a, a board meeting table to, to work from, because we don't have that now. So all last summer, last fall, you saw me in my car with my computer and we're sitting at a picnic table, you know, uh, but so we needed that space and now they're starting to see the rationale behind it. Uh, we need a, an additional meeting space, but we also need a cookhouse, like a kitchen so that we can prepare food properly for for the gatherings and um we're talking the elders are just starting talking about building an 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 like an indoor sweat lodge so that it can be used year round because they don't want people to go and do sweat lodges out out in the cold because they don't want them to get to get sick that sort of thing so these are just some of the things that we're uh we're talking about uh now next uh slide so i i discovered a spring that came out of the ground three Sundays ago. Yeah. And so, so we're really excited about that. Um, so the water, yeah, it's an artesian, exactly, an artesian, yeah, artesian spring. And, and so it's, a, it's 307 feet down. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, you can see where the sweat lodge uh, uh, stuff is over there. Yeah, it's not far, and then it's not far from there. So now we've uh, we've dug it up, we've capped it off, and uh, we'll, we're just waiting for the water tests to come back because we want to use it for for ceremony. So we got to figure out what kind of water feature we we want with it and have it accessible for people who want to access it. Pardon? Yeah, it is. It's connected to that spring across the creek. Yeah, yeah, and they've been using that water for since 18 oh yeah 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 it's right there so it's just a you know friend of mine a jewish friend of mine said that when when the when the people return the land responds yeah. right so this is a good sign for us and so now we're gonna we do something with it yeah. 
I'm um, Simag. I'm I'm done. So thank you, uh, everyone. Well, thank you, Lewis. That was amazing. <laughs> I, I feel like I have so much stuff in my head. It's going to take some time to process it. But if you have questions, could you come up? to this mic if you're able to. If you have problems with uh, mobility, I will bring the mic to you. We would ask that you use the mic though because we do have some friends with us on Zoom and I'd like to take this moment to just thank them for being there too and enjoying. And any people on Zoom, if you have questions, uh, you put them in the chat and you're gonna read them? Okay, we're going to put our uh, Zoom friends up on the screen and we'll give them an opportunity to ask their questions as well. Uh, but meanwhile, while we're getting that sorted, anyone here in the room, if you want to come up, if you're able to come up here, it'll be easier if you use this mic. You don't have to be really close to it or have your mouth on it. I'm just really curious about the ceremony Mm -hmm. that you might do with 75 lawyers in the room or 42 <laughs> aldermen in what? the what, 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 do you, what does the ceremony look like? It was a pipe ceremony. Okay. So you had, uh, you had like two different circles there and then you had the pipe, uh, the, the pipe ceremony leader uh, facing, uh, facing east. So it was a prayer ceremony. Actually, they were uh, with the Edmonton uh, Legal uh, community center or something like that. So they were starting their process of uh, strategic development. And so they wanted to come down there and do uh, and, and do a ceremony. So we put that together for them to uh, participate pipe ceremonies for some for the first time. And was that similar to what you did with the city managers and so on? Yeah. Before? Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. So yeah, so um, yeah, different kind of ceremonies for different uh, situations. But yes, yeah. Uh, I think I've been down there. It's in, it's in the River Valley. Can, can uh, um, how can we find out when it's open? Well, it's uh, right now. It's open to organizations who want to utilize the space. We haven't created any public programming as of yet, um, like public sweat lodges. Invite everybody to various things. When we have a public event, like we had our opening ceremonies and open house, we we invited everyone that we can think of. We opened up invitations whoever whoever wanted to come uh, through through social media, through news releases, uh, through the mainstream media. Uh, other organizations are having events down there, like Treaty Eight uh, Urban uh, Program here in Edmonton had 150. Um, uh, indigenous families, and they they announced that to invite their people. So we're we are not doing all the programming because when you have over sixty indigenous organizations in Edmonton, a lot they already have a lot of their programming, right? And some of the events are open to the public, but it's up to them if they want to um, advertise it. But for us, the elders do want to create what we're calling an outreach program to introduce Edmontonians or anybody else who wants to participate in a, in a, in a ceremony uh, of some sort, be it a pipe ceremony, a feast, or um, a sweat lodge ceremony, uh, holding ceremonies on special occasions like solstices and equinoxes, or special days like uh, June, June 21st. Um, those are, and also outreach programs for the uh, local uh, community leagues as well, so that they can be introduced uh, to not only ceremony, but also educational opportunities and things. And so, like I led two pilgrimages now from uh, St. Paul's United Church to um, uh, down to the site from, from, their, from their church and just introduce them uh, to the place. Uh, two Jewish congregations have been coming down on a regular basis. And uh, so we give them some, some teachings around various things. Uh, not always ceremony, but uh, like putting up a teepee and talking about what it means. And then they share some ceremony with us. And uh, so those are the kind of various things that, that we can do. But as soon as we have a public event that is open, we then will we'll promote it as, 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 as best as we can. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, anyone on Zoom with the question, just unmute yourself, please, and wave at us so that we can recognize you. Okay. Uh, I had to take a 
picture of it, but okay. So uh, Kathy Packford is just asking if it's open to the public or during certain hours. Yes, <clears throat> as I was saying, is that the gates are open when there is an event or an activity happening. And because we don't have the staff capacity right now to have, when we're working on this, and I think we'll have it solved here within the next uh, month or two, but um, because for, for legal purposes and risk management uh, purposes, we have to make sure there's someone there um, uh, just to ensure that everything's okay. And also to welcome people. It's not like it's closed. Like, you, you know, people are down there all the time. They just, it's not really tightly secure. You can just walk around the, the fence and there you are and you can walk in. And that happens all the time. And we, we're also very welcoming uh, when people want to come in and we get a chance to explain what the site is about. And we always welcome them to, walk around and, you know, just, uh, just be careful. And uh, yeah, that's so. Hi, thank you so much for that beautiful talk. What struck me as so wonderful is when you were talking in the earlier part about how you experienced prejudice and the, the very sad things that happened. And you kept repeating that you said to your elders in the group of people, that it was so important to practice your ceremonies mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you could elaborate a bit on that for me, because I found throughout my 75 years on the planet that sometimes when I get so angry and frustrated when people aren't listening or being unkind or mean or cruel, that the, the tempest pod in me is yes. like whoo, the blowtorch of anger yeah. versus, and that's the part I honor the most. So that's one part. And the second part is my daughter read braiding sweetgrass mm -hmm. and it changed her life. Yes. And she's 44 and she keeps telling me to read it. So I apologize. I haven't. But everything that you talked about is how she now embraces her oneness with the yes. land and the world. And it's really yeah. changed her. And just one thing I wanted to bring up was in my tradition, I was a meditation teacher for 50 years, TM, Marishi, mm -hmm. all that stuff, not associated with Marishi anymore. But in the Vedic tradition, that's 5,000 years old, 108 is a sacred number. Mm. And when you said the 108 people came to the blah, 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 yeah. my hair on my arm stood I, on I end. And that. I was like, blah, blah, <laughs> we got something going on here universally. Yeah. So I just wanted exactly. to ask about the ceremony, share that, and thank well, you. So the ceremonies much. vary, you know, and some okay. of the simplest things that you can do is when you're facing, uh, when, you, when you have that boiling kettle inside of you, right. we have our tradition of taking tobacco right. and uh, going off to, to a place to present it to the okay. ground, to, to speak to it, to kind of, you have to let go. Okay. And so for me, one of the traditions I was taught is take tobacco and, and go for a walk in nature and find a tree and uh, put, and uh, Talk to that, put your hand on a tree, yeah. hold that tobacco, because the trees will help you yeah, uh, I, to lift things the away from you. Yes. I do that and, anyway, but well, I didn't know well, that see, was a you, thing. Well, we're indigenous, all of us in certain <laughs> ways, aren't we? Yeah. And, and I used to do that. I, I visited jails for 20 years because mm -hmm. I had a son in jail. Yeah. And so I would always send angels north, south, east, and west and try to bless all the people and all yeah. the people that worked there because otherwise I'd get massive diarrhea. Yeah. Well, I did anyway. <laughs> I did anyway, but I knew yeah. to bless because I was a woman and as a woman, I feel everything in my womb and yeah. everything that when people are stressed, I feel it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to cry. Anyway, I love your talk. Thank you so oh, much. Well, I'm thank so you for glad that you it. were committed and did all that for all of us. Thank you. Well, I didn't do it alone. That, that is for sure. But, yeah, uh, but I'm just thanking thank all of everybody involved because we all are one. And as yeah. you say, when you heal and we all heal and yes. we fix the mess that was pre-generational. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you. We're not sending you away just yet. You can take your time, but on your way out, there are little um, goodie bags from Western Varieties that they brought us for one of our earlier events. We had quite a few left over, so please help yourself <laughs> to one or two or... <laughs> okay. Any other questions from our Zoom attendees? Any other questions in the room? Then I was, oh, yes, 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 I was yeah. just about to do that. Very good. So Chris, Crystal Auger is um, 
has a catering business. She is an Indigenous person from the community. We are so happy that she has been available for these events to cater this wonderful soup and uh, bannock for us. And so we have great gratitude for her presence amongst us. I would just like to extend uh, an invitation to your congregation to come down to Kitchiaski and I'll be able to give you a little tour and we would visit some more yeah so and we can work that out at some time wonderful yeah. we will take you up on that okay <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> and so we will uh, we will advertise that when we make that available and um Please, and we're so happy that many people from the community outside of our little Westwood congregation have come to join us tonight. So we really appreciate that because these evenings are meant to be a circle that is wider than just our community and brings people in. So thank you for your presence here. It is truly appreciated. And to our little group, and if you want to be part of the, um, if you want to be part of the people who organize this, we're open to that too. We're, we're, we're a very open community here. So reconciliation at westwoodunitarian.ca uh, is our email address and our website has all that information and just shoot us a little message and we'll be happy to bring you in. Victor. Definitely tell a very loving community. Mm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. And thank you so much again, Louis. Yes. And Darlene. Oh, yeah. Well, Victor Putri is a direct descendant of Chicago. Yes. Yeah. So thank you. So we feel blessed with it's been an amazing evening. If anybody wants to take me, that's a little longer. Yeah. We're very transparent. Yeah, I was just going to say, don't feel that you have to rush off, even though we're winding up. There's, you know, we're not going to kick you out. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to hang around and come up and see this, talk to the people, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Thank you. Oh, and of course, <laughs> one last thing. We, we are happy to host this event. We do have a donation box back there, the blue one by the door. And we do appreciate your support. Um, donations come go back into helping us present these kinds of events. That's where the money goes. OK? I just one more yep. question. Yep, Lindsay. Hi. I just finished uh, a course through Ella, um, Edmonton Lifelong Learners, um, with Kira Knightley called mm -hmm. Indigenous Ecologies. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering if the um, your organization is going to do um, like native planting or um, like rather than uh, uh, non native plantings? Yeah. Oh, cool. Hello, hello. Yeah, it's just that's okay. It's just it's just that our people on Zoom can't hear what you're saying. Yeah, no kidding. Just don't give it. No, my uh, my cousin George Quinn. He wrote a book on. Well, you can't say it, native planting. It's just planting in general, and it just yeah. There you go. Well. Yeah, he's, he talks about organic materials, and unfortunately, he's not with us here tonight. He couldn't make it in, but he's written a number of books, and and he's getting into traditional um, planting, uh, yeah. and he's a knowledge keeper and a pipe carrier with our nation, Wonderful. and he is also a direct descendant of Chief Papas yeah. Chase, and he's been here a few times already uh, with the congregation, and uh, uh, he descends from the son of Chief Papas Chase, Joseph Sarsine Quinn, which is the same line as Victor. And uh, that's the treaty children that we're arguing for in the Federal Court of Appeal right now, because we, we believe that the treaty children should not have been automatically included in the script taking of their parents. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was a form of involuntary enfranchisement. I'm a lawyer and I could go on and on. So um, it's getting too late at night for that. So, uh, but thank you for allowing us to have that issue brought up and brought to Lewis's attention. And thank so you. maybe Lewis can answer the question though, about whether that's going to happen down there, that traditional uh, medicine going to be yes. or plants are going to be grown. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. um, 
I know a lady in the Edmonton community. She owns Mother Earth Essentials, um, which is on 124th Street. Yeah. She is excellent. I have a feeling she's of Papa Chase descendants, but I don't know. I'd have to confirm with her. Um, she has a book out, a few books actually, about um, traditional med medicine picking. So that would be where I would direct your question and your curiosity as well. She's amazing with all of what she knows. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks. And I would like to thank Lindsay, who has been a driving force around our gardens around this church. So we, we do have some lovely beds and gardens around this church once the snow goes away. And Lindsay has been the driving force of organizing that and yeah, taking out a lot of, yeah, yeah, she's been taking out a lot of the non-native uh, plants and replacing them with, with native plants and it's it's really lovely in the summer and people are invited to come and plant and also to harvest um back there so yeah, we'd like to kind of get george involved in that yeah. in the yeah. spring but he's yeah yeah with you guys but that's up to him to do he's he's connected yeah true but i meant to yeah. <laughs> so, so there is great interest in that. When is our next meeting? Oh, it's May. Yeah. May tenth. May tenth will be the next speaker. Do we have the speaker confirmed? No, we don't have the speaker confirmed, but we'll be getting that information out as quickly as possible. And we're always open. We do have, we have the soup confirmed. The soup is confirmed. It will be here. And uh, there will be a speaker. And if you have suggestions, we're always open to suggestions for people who might want to speak and be part of this, uh, this event. Okay, so I will liberate you. Go. <laughs> Thank you.